Hi, my name's Matt. I'm what they call a lead pastor here at South Point Church. We're so excited that you are gonna join us on this journey. Hey, as I start out, I wanna say it is rare, but sometimes you get to be a part of a once in a lifetime opportunity that either you don't deserve or you didn't see coming. For me, it's being a part of South Point. South Point started in a living room with about 10 people that dreamed of launching a church. Not just any kind of church, but a different kind of church. A church that would reach those who had given up on church. A church where those who had never been to church would love to attend. A church that welcomed and loved skeptics and outsiders and the marginalized. The kind of church where God's love for people was so compelling that followers of Jesus would put aside their comfort and their preferences to be a part of a legacy that God is creating. Out of that, South Point was launched. And from the beginning, it was obvious that God was leading the way as results have been far above anything that we could do ourselves. I mean, our very first Sunday, it snowed here in Southern Maryland, and still over 200 people showed up on our first service. And in less than two years, we were at three services with over 500 people. Then we moved to Leonardtown High School, and then we purchased almost 50 acres of land for a million dollars less than our original offer. And we've taken risks like the Christmas Village or the Easter egg drop. We've launched a campus in Lusby. We engaged Colony Square in a partnership. And we bought a townhouse to create a future after school program. And lives have been impacted. Do you realize that over 12,500 first time visitors have walked through the doors of South Point Church, hearing that there's a God who made them and loved them and wants to be their friend? That's almost 10% of our community's population. Back in our kids' areas, between our two campuses, it's over 220 kids, which is larger than the average church in America on Sunday. Our average attendance puts us in the top 10% of churches here in America. And what's stunning is in churches all across America, half of them don't lead a single person to Jesus. At South Point, we've had over 900 first-time decisions for Jesus. And we've baptized over 1,007 people into the family of God. For me, South Point gave me the courage I needed to give up control to Jesus and to join a small group. Stephen Ministry at South Point loved and cared for me when my mom passed away. Through South Point, I discovered who God made me to be. May God use South Point to provide me with a community of family that I left behind. To be a part of an impact like that is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. And God has been faithful to show up and bless the service and sacrifice of our dream filled efforts. Now listen, as great as our past is, we are unwilling to settle for having our best days behind us. We know our legacy is not complete and that God is not done. We think the kind of impact that God wants us to launch in our communities is far from over. Yes, South Point's impact has been undeniably blessed by God, but our journey has been filled with obstacles. And some of these obstacles, they limit our ability to impact people and to touch their lives. Now imagine, if there was something that you and I could do to remove these obstacles that would significantly increase our ability to create life-changing impact on behalf of Jesus. Not attempting to remove these obstacles is basically saying to those people we could reach for Jesus that we'll just close our eyes and ignore them. And we find that totally unacceptable. That's never who South Point will be. So with that in mind, our dream of leaving a legacy of life change beyond ourselves and for generations is leading you and I and us to launch our next steps. We're excited and ask you to join us as we take those next steps. Imagine if our next steps changed our community forever. What if our commitment to loving God and caring deeply about people 
led us to take a bold step that could alter the future generations for decades to come. Think about all the possibilities for impact that South Point could have if we could remove some of the biggest obstacles that we face. That's what launching a legacy is all about. You see, we believe the next step to removing our most challenging obstacles is to build a permanent facility on our property. Now this building will have the potential to be a launch pad of impact, and not just for our generation, but for generations to come. You see, we know that a church home can create the kind of change that forever alters the community around it. There are three specific ways a permanent church home could create a lasting legacy. One is a permanent location provides a stable and a strategic launch pad for God-directed opportunities, maybe like launching another campus. The second way it does it is a secure church home becomes a highly effective platform which allows us to be better and to be more creative in reaching people that matter deeply to God. And thirdly, a church building tells our community that we're committed to creating a legacy for the long term. So you might be asking, why now? What has changed that makes having a church facility a real possibility? The successful launch of our Lusby campus has allowed us to reduce the original footprint of our building by almost 50%. We've also been able to reduce the scope and the scale of this project by almost $10 million to $5.2 million. And our targeted opening date would be Easter of 2020. And by the way, we absolutely intend to keep our Lesby campus open and supported as we passionately love our Calvert community. Let's be clear, launching a legacy initiative isn't about comfort and convenience of a building. It's about creating life change and impact on behalf of Jesus. South Point isn't trying to create a hideaway, but a launch pad. Our next steps are all about launching a legacy that creates impact that changes lives for generations to come. You and I have an opportunity of a lifetime that lies before us. There's a chance for us to be a part of something that forever changes our community and impacts eternity. But what will it take to remove the obstacles so we can create the kind of impact that changes lives for generations? The answer is simple. It will require generosity and sacrifice. Our next steps, a permanent building, is only possible if South Point raises $1.25 million over the next three years in our Launching a Legacy initiative. You know, impacting future generation never comes easily or free. It only happens when passionate people choose to invest in the future. I'm gonna ask you personally to do a couple of simple things. First, simply, would you pray and sincerely ask God, what is your role, and allow Him to shape your response? Would you ask and honestly ask yourself and God, where am I on this journey of giving back to God? And where does God want me to be on that journey? And simply, would you say yes and commit to how God is leading you to partner financially with South Point? It's three simple things to pray, ask, and then commit. Lastly, Someday, when you and I are much older, we'll be asked by the next generation, what adventure stole our hearts and got the best of us? They'll be looking to you and I, hoping to find some clue of what's worthy of a lifetime investment. And may you and I answer bringing heaven down to earth, and that we made Jesus so famous that people couldn't help but fall in love with Him and follow Him. You see, we believe that building a launch pad for generational life change is a legacy worthy of our best. As we move forward, may you and I make God smile with how we use our lives. We're so glad that you're with us, uh, especially in this season as South Point might be taking some of its most significant steps in its life ever. And so we're so glad that you chose to be with us today. Hey, uh, we just watched a video. Uh, we just watched a video about where South Point has been. We just watched a video about where South Point is and where South Point is called uh, to be. And before I kind of dive into that, I wanted to take a second uh, to say something to everyone who calls South Point their home, our Lesby campus, or Leonardtown, to those of you who watch online. I wanted to take a second to say um, it's truly been a privilege to partner with you over the last 13 years and see all that God has done. 
Before I even say or do anything, I want to say to all of you that call South Point your home, I want to say thank you. It's because of your support. I mean, the way that you guys consistently and, and kind of with great humor and energy regularly invite people here. I want to thank you for your service. I love that people passionately show up here to volunteer at South Point. When people show up on Sundays, they're not grouchy. They're not begrudgingly. People who come here and serve have a great smile. People that work with the kids have a great smile. So not only do I want to thank you for your support of inviting people, I want to thank you for your service of, of really making South Point an amazing experience. And then last thing, I want to thank you for your sacrifice. For many of you, you generously, financially partner with South Point because what we do doesn't just happen. And so I just want to say thank you for your support, your service, and your sacrifice. You make South Point the place that it is. Now, in the video, you saw a lot of the things and accomplishments that South Point has had. As a matter of fact, by most standards of definition, South Point is very, very successful. And I want to acknowledge and say that I understand and that we would all understand that, listen, all of our success comes from God. Listen, God's blessed us. It's God's grace and goodness. However, with success comes two things. And these two things that success comes with, one of them you're going to recognize. When I talk about the things that come with success, you're going to go, oh yeah, that makes sense. But but there's a hint thing that comes with success that when I talk about it, you may go, oh, I had never really ever thought about it that way. Now, here's the first thing that comes with success, responsibility. Anybody remember Spider-Man and Peter Parker, right? With, with, okay, three of you, great. That analogy is going to work awesome. Get out, people, right? Like he said, with great, or with great power comes great responsibility. And the reality is, is with great success comes responsibility. Right? Because listen, if God entrusted us with the lives of people showing up at our doors and visiting South Point and showing up and joining our small groups and getting engaged, then we need to be responsible and honor the success that he's given us. And we're going to get to that in a second about, about kind of like honoring that and being responsible for the success that he's given us. But here's the second thing that comes with success that no one ever really understands. With success comes danger. See, we never actually think about danger coming with success because we're like, hey, you're successful, it's all working. How could anything be dangerous? But here's what is true. I've experienced it, you've experienced it, everyone in the world has experienced it. We're going to put up on the uh, here on the screen. Listen, a great danger to our future success is our. Listen, one of the biggest dangers to our future success is our past success. And you've seen it in churches, you've seen it in sports teams, you've seen it in businesses where people start to make statements like, we've never done it that way. Oh, we don't do that. We, we can't afford to take risks. We can't afford to do initiatives. Like we just want to stay where we are. We want to stay safe. And one of the greatest dangers to the success that God has given us is our past success that will sometimes hinder us from moving on to our future. Now here at South Point, we have a, a little saying and it goes something like this. And listen, I'm convicted and I believe the leadership of South Point is convicted that listen, God is not done. God is not done doing what God wants to do. So South Point is not finished. Matter of fact, we have a little phrase and we're going to put it up on the screen and it goes something like this. If you follow on, listen, Jesus is honored by a future that is better than our Listen, and you know what the most important words of this whole phrase are? Jesus is honored. Because here, listen, listen. How much is Jesus honored when all we can do is go, man, look how great we used to be. Look at the things that we used to do. Look how God used to change lives. How is Jesus honored? How are people pointed to Jesus? How are lives changed and impacted when all we have is our past? And here at South Point, we are deeply convicted that Jesus is honored by a future that is better than our past. And so we don't just finish this. We have, we're going to finish this statement. It goes something like this. Jesus is honored by a future that is better in the past. So we're committed to creating a legacy of lasting life change. Because God's not done. We're not finished. Our best days are not behind us. Our best days are in front of us. We believe the best is yet to come. Which leads us to the moment that South Point finds itself in. You see, we find ourselves in somewhat of a unique place. Here's the place that South Point is a church in our kind of life cycle that we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a moment of in-between. We are in between creating a legacy that lasts for generations or for settling for just having a great past. We're at a crossroads in the life of South Point Church 
where we're going to make a decision. Do we serve and do we sacrifice to create a legacy that lasts beyond ourselves, that honors Jesus, or will we settle? Will we use rest and convenience and comfort and rest on our past success? And the reality is, in this next season, our decision will launch us into one to two directions. Either how we decide will launch us into creating a lasting legacy, or it will launch us into being irrelevant, where our best days are behind us. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. We've all experienced it. Life will often bring us moments where we have to make a decision. And the decision in that moment will launch us in a direction maybe that we never saw or we never imagined. Today, I want to share with you one such moment. Matter of fact, this moment launched my life in a direction I would have never imagined in such a great way that I am so thankful. Matter of fact, it's one of the moments that drove me and it's why I'm on the stage this morning. It happened back when I was young. I was probably 24. I was just recently married. And I had a friend who had gone to Penn State College. And at Penn State College, he had gotten involved in this organization called Young Life. And Young Life works with high school and middle school students. Instead of asking students to come somewhere, Young Life leaders go to schools and they work with kids and then they introduce them to Jesus. And my friend, Sam, who had graduated from Penn State, he called me up and said, Matt, could you financially support me? To which I said, no, we can't afford it, which was really a lie. I just wasn't good at managing my money, right? And so I said, listen, I can't support you, but here's what I can do. I can volunteer. And he was trying to start Young Life at this high school in our local area, and there's no Young Life. And he said, Matt, if you're going to volunteer, would you come to Young Life camp with me? I want you to kind of volunteer for a week. I want to kind of let you see what it is that we would be doing. And I said, sure. And he says, listen, I can't pay you. You're going to have to take, take time off of work. And I said, that's fine. I can take a week off of work. And so um, I went to this thing called Young Life Camp. I'd never been there before. I hadn't grown up in Young Life. And I was amazed when I showed up at the bus. And here's why I was amazed when I showed up at the bus. The bus was full. There was two buses of kids, almost 100 kids. And most of these kids, they weren't church kids. They were everyday high school kids who typically came from an unchurched background. And they all seemed fired up. They all seemed excited. I was like, wow, uh, do they know they're going to church camp? Because, you know, that's the only kind of thing I had for it. Go, they're going to a camp. They seem really excited. And, and most of them seem to have not gone to church. So I'm like, man, this is going to be crazy. And I remember on the bus ride just how the, the Young Life leaders had this relationship with the kids that I had never seen before. And I was struck when I showed up to Young Life Camp. I was amazed because when I thought of camp, I thought of like third class. Because you know how Christians usually do. We don't fund things that are important like eternal salvation. We, we fund other things, but we're never really going to fund, you know, churches and, and, and Christian organizations usually are third class. But this was first class. Somebody obviously believed in this mission because when I showed up, the camp was beautiful. It was amazing. It was organized. And here's what I loved. It was excellent and there was this energy. There was just this like God created life and for us to experience. Jesus said that I've come that you might have life and life to the full. And somebody here actually believed this. What was amazing is at the end of every day after swimming and kayaking and motorbiking and all these cool things that kids got to do, they had this thing called club and a, and a camp speaker would get up for about 20 minutes and they would share the basic story of God, Jesus and how God wants to be our friend and what Jesus did so that we could become sons and daughters of the Most High. And the speaker spoke in a way that I'd never heard before. It wasn't overtly religious. It was so simple and so clear. But that's not the moment that launched my life in a different direction. You see, at the end of the week, they have this thing called the say-so. And on the last night there, they do this thing, which is amazing, because there's five to 600 high schoolers, most of them unchurched. And they say, listen, we're going to ask you to go out in the camp. You've heard the message, and we're going to give you 20 minutes to respond. Here's the only thing that we ask is that you would not talk and you're not silent. You know, we know you may have came with your best buds or your girlfriend. We're not asking this to be cuddle time. We're asking this to be your own individual time. And what was amazing to me is, is that five to 600 high school students, most of them who were unchurched, actually were quiet. And then they filed back into this club room, all five or 600. It was, it was amazing. And then the Young Life leader who was speaking stood up and he said, hey, if you said yes to Jesus, we're going to do something called a say-so, and I'd like you to stand up and just say the decision that you made today. Now, I expected nobody to stand up. I mean, it's, it's high school students, right? And then all of a sudden, all across the room, one by one, students began to stand up. 
and they had this microphone and they would pass it around and, and kids only got a second. There was someone who held it and my name is and I'm from here and I said yes to Jesus today. And this was repeated all across the room, one after another, after another, after another. And I started weeping as I saw kids who were far from God hear about a God who made them, a God who loved them, and a God who wanted to be their friend. And that night, something happened that launched my life in a totally different direction. I made a vow. I said, this is what I could give my life to. I could give my life so that people could know Jesus. I could give my life to something where people say yes to Jesus. I could give my life to something where people say, I'm going to follow Jesus. And in that moment, I said, I want my life to go to something like this. And it's altered the course of my life. But it wasn't the only time I said yes to a moment that launched me in a different direction. I eventually said yes to going on to Young Life staff and leaving my professional job where I was offered a partnership in a multi-million dollar company. I said yes to moving from the only home that I'd ever lived at for more than a year and a half to move to St. Mary's. I said yes to planning a church called South Point. I said yes to launching a campus instead of building on our property when it didn't seem popular. And I've never once regretted any of the yeses at those moments that have launched my life in a direction that I'm forever grateful for. But as I thought about all those moments that launched my life in a direction that I never saw, that I wasn't worthy of, that I'm so grateful for, listen, they all have this common theme. All my yeses have this theme woven through it. As a matter of fact, this one common three theme that has launched my life in a direction I never imagined is actually at the core of who we are here at South Point. And here it is. People matter deeply to God. Matter of fact, God so loved people that God did the unimaginable. God left heaven. God the Son showed up in a busted and broken world. And he loved the broken and he loved the sinner and he healed the sick and he hung out with people that other people said, why are you hanging out with them? God showed up and God didn't just show up. God was not only with us, God sacrificed to pay a penalty for my brokenness and my sin and your sin and your brokenness and the world's sin and brokenness. He sacrificed so that no one would have to miss out on being in a relationship with the God who created them. And here's the most mind-boggling thing that I've ever heard is that God invites you, God invites me, God invites us to partner with him. Which leads me to the core of what we are here at South Point. We have a God-given mission. I know this isn't really popular and I really don't care. The church does not exist for itself the church exists for the world around it. I say it this way. Listen, we're going to put it up here on the screen. Listen, the church is not a club. South Point is not a place where you come and put something on the plate or you write a check and then you get to have what you want. You get the music you want. You get the style of preaching you want. You get your, this is not a club. They have clubs. You can go join those. This is not a clique. This is not where you get to come and hang out with people who look like you, talk like you, and vote like you. The last time I checked, God loves all people, and Jesus came to redeem all people. And listen, we have more to unite us in Jesus than divides us. Okay, so we're not a clique. We're not a club. It's a community on a... We're on a rescue mission. And if you're looking for a club or a clique, please leave now. Because you won't be satisfied. You will not like it here. Listen, South Point is a place that wants to help you grow in your faith. We have small groups and we have classes. And if you want to engage in the community, we are absolutely going to care. We're absolutely going to raise up people. We're going to care and disciple people. But at the end of the day, we are on a rescue mission. And you might be asking, Matt, is this one of those new fad things? Is this, is this kind of a fad or style? And I would go, no. You know where I got this idea from? God. 
It's right in the Bible. So we're going to do something a little bit different. I am going to go through like three or four scriptures, which I rarely do here, but I need every person here. Listen, if you're a visitor or your guest, just, you just can sit back and eat popcorn today and watch. But here's what I would say. If you come here and you have no faith or different faith, you get to see how much you matter to God and how much you matter to us. This God-given mission where we're not a club or a clique doesn't actually come from me. It actually comes from Scripture. Matter of fact, it comes from the Old Testament, the New Testament. Matter of fact, we see in Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet. He's speaking to this nation, Israel. You might be asking, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, Israel was a group of people that God said, listen, I'm going to impact all the rest of the world with this nation, Israel. Matter of fact, the whole world will get to see what God's like through Israel, kind of like the church. The whole world will get to see what God's like through the church. And he's speaking to this, this nation that was supposed to make the whole world see what God is like, but they just mess it up. They mess it up. And here is God speaking to that nation and to those leaders through the prophet Ezekiel. This is what the sovereign Lord says. He says, woe to you shepherds of Israel. Now the shepherds of Israel are the leaders. There's the, the ones that should know better. He said, woe to you shepherds of Israel. You only take care of yourselves. Should the shepherds not take care of the flock? He's saying, listen, you're only caring about yourself. You know you were made for more than just to care about yourself. You were made for a greater purpose. You were made to have an impact. You were made for purpose. You can't consume your way to happiness or purpose. And he goes on to say this, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. That's why at South Point, we can say you can come as you are. There are no perfect people allowed because we will mess you up. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the, or, I mean, God all of a sudden says, not only do you not care for the flock, but you haven't helped people and you haven't searched or brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled over them harshly and brutally. And if it wasn't enough to say it once, God continues to say, my sheep wandered all over the mountains on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one, or, and then here's what God says. If you think searching and looking for people who are disconnected from God matters to the heart of God, look what he closes with. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and I will look after them. People matter deeply to the heart of God. They matter so much that God would do the unimaginable. He would leave his comfort and he would sacrifice to bring us home. But this message, this theme is continued with Jesus in the New Testament, we're going to put the next scripture up here, Luke. This is one of the most famous passages, it's Luke 15. And by the way, if you ever read, I encourage you to read this week, Luke 15. Listen, if you read of all of Luke 15, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees who are all grumbling. Hey, Jesus, why are you hanging out with those people? I don't know who those people are, but apparently even in those days, they had those people. Jesus was hanging out with those people. All the religious folks were angry. But Jesus responds to me, says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99? It is not a value issue, it's a priority issue. Will he not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go for the one who is lost until he finds it? And if that isn't enough, Jesus said, listen, just in case you missed it, Jesus tells another parable and he says, or suppose a woman has a 10 silver coins. It's kind of like a set. They usually get them in their wedding is kind of how it went. And they lose one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully? Not just search for it, but search carefully until she finds it. So Jesus doesn't just tell one parable, he tells a second parable. And then he's thinking, listen, you're not getting it. So he tells a parable about two sons, the prodigal son, probably one of the most famous parables. And then it ends with this. The father said to the son who was kind of at home and angry that, you know, the father had taken back his son. He said, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. And then he goes on to say, we had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was but now he is found. And if you don't th think the church is a rescue mission, after Jesus had willingly gone, listen, no one put Jesus on the cross. He allowed himself. He said, listen, I could call 12 leads a day. No one put Jesus on the cross. Jesus went willing to the cross. He died. He paid our sin and debt. He conquered hell and death. His tomb is empty. Listen, here's a historical fact. You can disagree with what it means, but the tomb of Jesus is empty, right? 
And so the tomb is empty. The disciples are going, what is going on? There's only one or two disciples. Um, Mary's the only person to see him. And the two people on the way back to Emmaus have seen him, but no one else has seen him. All the disciples are huddling in fear, wondering if they're next. And then Jesus shows up. We see this in John 20. We're going to pick it up and says, Jesus said to them, nope, yep. Jesus, suddenly Jesus was standing among them. So Jesus, resurrected Jesus, shows up in the middle and says, listen, I'm alive. And they're freaked out. They're so freaked out that Jesus had to say, peace be with you. Because they're like, whoa. He's like, listen, I'm not here to slay you. I'm not here to crush you. Like, I'm here. And as he spoke, he showed them their, his wounds and his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And then Jesus goes on to say, again, peace be with you. And then what he says next has to be important. Because he doesn't stay for long. But he shows up to say, listen, I've risen from the dead. And then he gives them their marching orders. As the Father has, so I am We're a sent people. The church is a rescue mission. And if you don't believe me, just watch the news. Read a paper. Go on Facebook. Read Twitter. We live in a world that is broken and disconnected and divided. In desperate need of something that can turn our world around. And you know who has the hope of the world? We do. You, me, those that name the name of Jesus, those that are followed of Jesus, we, we bear the hope of the world. The one who conquered hell and death. We have what the world needs. And we shouldn't huddle or hide. We need to engage our world. So we're on a God-given mission. Which leads me to the second truth, which is this, and we're going to put up here on the screen, which is we have obstacles that hinder our mission. We have a God-given mission to see people who are disconnected from God get connected to Christ, to get connected into community, and then get connected to a cause. That is kind of our mission statement. It's been our mission statement since the beginning. It'll continue to be our mission statement. We want to connect the disconnected to Christ, community, and cause, but we have some obstacles. And here are the four obstacles we have. We have some resource obstacles. We have some excellent obstacles. Um, we have some, um, you know, we have some growth obstacles. Um, we have some obstacles that are, that are hindering us. Availability kind of resources. And so we have some things that are actually limiting us. And here's what's limiting us is that being our resources, excellence, opportunities, and growth. And, and here's the thing is, listen, being totally portable. We are a totally portable church right now. We only have two portable campuses, Leonardtown and Lesby. And so being totally portable at this scale, this size, and at our age of being 13 years old, being portable isn't bad, but it is limiting these four things. You think about it, our resources, our time, our energy, and our money. Do you know how much time and energy and money goes on just to executing the Sunday morning experience at two schools? So much energy, so much resources. Instead of spending those resources on doing the church, we could actually reinvest those and reallocate those things and actually invest them in being the church. How about in excellence? Did you know in most of our schools that we're just limited to our excellence? Listen, like here at Leonardtown, we don't even have access to Wi-Fi. And some Sundays in the summer, we don't have access to air conditioning. And it's not just excellence, it's the things that we could create in our own building that as we could support our Lusby campus. And I just want to say something, because this is the number one question I often get kind of about a building. And it's, what, what about Lusby? Are we going to keep Lusby open? And the answer is yes! We love our Lusby campus, and we are committed to our Calvert community. Within a 30-minute drive of Patuxent High School, there's roughly 50,000 people, and there is a need for a church like South Point in that community. So we're committed to that. Just so you know, Lusby, we love you and are for you. But it limits our excellence. It limits our opportunities. Listen, the space, whenever we want to do something, we have to rent the school. We only get the school from six in the morning till two o'clock and we have to rent it and pay for it. We only get it for a few hours in the week. And the same with Patuxent. We just have some availability and some access issues. And lastly, it limits our growth. And this is what I want to talk about. Because people always go, well, why do we need to grow? Because People matter deeply to the heart of God. Did you, did you read this? Like people are our mission. Reaching more people is the mission that the church is involved in. And if we have things like resources and excellence, opportunities that are limited because we're totally portable, that are hindering our ability to reach people, then we should do whatever it takes to overcome these obstacles. 
which leads us straight into the point number three, which is kind of our thing. We have a plan to fulfill our mission. And here's our plan. I announced it in the video. It's to build on our property on St. Andrew's Church Road. We have almost 50 acres there. We're going to build a permanent campus there to launch lasting life change that honors Jesus. And now here's the first question. I, yeah, I'm pretty fired up about that, man. I'm glad these people are. Whoever they are, give them a little extra, right? So thank you. Um, and here's why I'm fired up about it, because listen, and this is the question I always get when I talk about building a permanent campus on our St. Andrew's Church property road is, is well, what about Lusby? And I always say, Lusby's gonna stay open. We love our Lusby campus. We are absolutely committed. Did you know within a 30 minute radius of Patuxent High School, there's almost 50,000 people and they need a church like South Point. So we are committed to our Calvary community. We wanna keep that campus open. A permanent campus, it's not a place to huddle. It's not a place to hide. It's not a place for us to just circle the wagons. It is meant to be a launch pad to God-given opportunities, hopefully for other campuses, and to continue to grow and help people see, know, and love, and follow Jesus. A building becomes one of the most strategic resources for maximum impact. And here's what it allows us to do. A permanent facility allows us to reallocate our resources. And people always think, I can't wait to have a building. It's going to be so easy. And I go, no, you misunderstand. It's not going to be easier. It's just going to be different. We just reallocate some of the things that we're doing now to doing church, to being the church. Matter of fact, having a building and growing might actually be more difficult, but it'll be more efficient with our resources. You wanna talk about excellence. Think about the things that we could do that we could create for other campuses and for our community. If we had our own space, think about the quality of the excellence that we could do. Having our own space available to us seven days a week and to be able to use it to reach the community and for it to be a community resource. And all of those three things help us grow and reach more people for Jesus, which is our mission. There you go. Good. You guys are catching on. Good. That's our, that's our mission is to love God and to love others and to point people to him. And if I had to sum up where we're at today, we're in this unique place. We're in this unique place in the history of the life of the church where we're at a, a choice where where we decide in this season will have an eternal impact. If we decide creating a lasting legacy that honors Jesus is worthy of our sacrifice, worthy of our service, worthy of our effort, we will launch in the next phase and we will honor Jesus and create a legacy. We may decide and wave the white flag and settle for safety and convenience and rest on our past success. But whatever decision we make will have an impact. And so my hope and my prayer is that you and I will make a decision that honors Jesus. And to be able to do that, I want to kind of sum it up this way, which is this. We're going to put it up here on the screen. Would you prayerfully? Because at the end of the day, listen, it's not about what I say on Sunday. I don't want to shame, guilt, or compel anyone to do anything. You should be a part of this because you love Jesus and you feel like Jesus wants you to be a part of something bigger and that you love and care for people. Would you prayerfully ask God how he wants you or your family to partner in our mission? Because at the end of the day, hopefully you're not doing it for me. Hopefully you're not doing it for someone else here. You're doing it for God. Now I want to close the message by going a little bit backwards. You see, South Point started with a dream. You know, I remembered all the way back to when those kids stood up all across the room. And when South Point was launched, I dreamed of a day that we'd have a church where adults would walk in and they would see a group of people who thought the mission was worthy enough to make it excellent. I dreamed of a day that we'd have a church where I could talk about Jesus in everyday language, that everyday people, regardless of where they've been, why they were there, what's been done, that they could see that there was a God who loved them, a God who made them, a God who died for their sins. I dreamed, and the people that helped plant this church dreamed of a church where people every Sunday would make decisions, not some religious decision, but a heartfelt decision to follow Jesus all the days of their life. That's what we were launched with. And I'm so grateful for all the people that have partnered over the years to say yes to launching our church in that direction. 
Now, have any of you noticed the lights behind me? That hopefully you have. <laughs> it's, not a set, it's not a design. We didn't put up there just to put lights up there. Did you know those lights actually represent something? You know what those lights represent? Over the last 13 years, they represent every person who has at least filled out a Connect card saying they made a first-time decision for Christ. There's over 903 lights on the board, 903 people who crossed over from death to life, people who walked through the doors of South Point every Sunday who said yes to Jesus because we said yes to him. And here is my hope, and here is my prayer. The lights would not stop here. That as we look at this and realize those represents people and eternities and stories and lives, that we would say yes to whatever direction God wants to launch us in so we can continue. So that for decades and decades and decades, more and more lights and what they represent, that lives have followed Jesus, would happen. There's a choice before us. And whatever choice we make will launch us in one of two directions. Whatever we choose, may it launch us in a direction that honors Jesus. Let me pray. Hey God, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to partner with you and bringing up there down here. I consistently am amazed, God, that you use busted and broken and normal everyday people to bring heaven down here. God, I think we forget that we, we carry in our hearts as we go out to the world the one thing that it needs. The love of God found not in religion or teachings, but in a person named Jesus. And God, we believe to honor Jesus that our best days are not now, our best days are not behind us, God, we believe the best is yet to come. God, move our hearts. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that are open and soft. May we say yes to something that launches our lives and our church in a direction we never would have imagined. That we'd get to partner with something that is a once in a life opportunity to impact eternity. May we make you smile. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.